Welcome to another episode of the Wellbe Podcast. I'm very excited about my guest today. Her name is Dr. Carrie Jones, and she's a naturopathic physician, aka an ND, with a master's in public health. She has over 12 years in the field of functional and integrative medicine and is an adjunct faculty member for the National University of Natural Medicine. She specializes in women's health and hormones and has taught courses in both gynecology and advanced endocrinology. She's been the medical director for two large integrative clinics in Portland, Oregon, and is currently the medical director for Precision Analytical, which makes a hormone test called the Dutch test. Carrie, welcome. Thanks, thanks so much for having me, I'm excited. I'm so excited too. So you are actually the first naturopath that I've ever had on my show, which is shocking to me. <laughs> I love naturopaths. Um, so can you explain what the difference between an MD and an ND is as far as training and in practice? Yeah, absolutely. And I was en route to become an MD, um, M is in medicine, um, and then switched tracks and became a ND, a naturopathic doctor. So an ND goes to medical school. We go for four years. Um, for, and I did a two-year residency. But a naturopathic doctor um, definitely has the bigger view of like the healing power of nature, a more vitalistic approach, really getting to the root cause. And we have something that we work on. It's called the therapeutic order. So it's kind of going from the least invasive to the most invasive in that order. Um, and I would like to think that sort of all doctors uh, across the world want to follow this. But as we find a lot of conventionally trained MDs, you know, if you have heartburn, you get a pill, right? If you have pain, you get a pill. If you, you know, have heavy periods, you get a pill. Whereas a naturopathic doctor works quite a bit differently. We work to find like, why do you have heartburn? What is triggering it? What's going on with your intestines? What's going on with your stomach? You know, why are you in pain? Why do you have inflammation? What's going on with your joints or what's going on with your muscles? Why do you have heavy periods? Is it a hormone imbalance? Is it iron deficiency? Is it low thyroid? What have you? And so we kind of reverse engineer uh, to figure out more, can we do it from a natural approach? Can we do it from diet and lifestyle? Can we integrate supplements and herbs? And if we can't, then we can move on to more advanced pharmaceuticals, referring for surgery, that sort of thing. So it's a really nice option to be a naturopathic doctor because we have this huge scope that we can work in and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of tools that we can use for you as a patient. That's awesome. So what's that look like as far as your training? Is it, I know, you know, conventional medical school in America is, I think it's four years and then mm -hmm. it's a certain amount of residency and usually in hospitals. So what's the equivalent for naturopath? It's a little bit different. So we do go to four years of medical school. So it's four years of naturopathic medical school. Uh, so you have to have an undergrad you, and you have to meet prerequisites, of course, med pre-medicine requisites. Four years of medical school, and then much like an MD, we have the option for doing residencies. So not all MDs do residencies, and not all NDs do residencies as well. And so we go through all of the ology, you know, classes, and we go through, you know, even right from gross cadaver lab, we learn minor surgery. We do, you know, gerontology, oncology, gastroenterology, gynecology, and we do rotations not through hospitals but through clinics instead. Naturopathic doctors are not hospitalists, um, but uh, cl more clinic clinicians. And so that's where we do our rotations through. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks for explaining that. I feel like <laughs> it's something I know about, but not everybody really has interacted with an ND before. So yes. they're curious like what that means. Can you talk about your journey? You mentioned that you were on the path to being an MD that made you decide to become a naturopathic doctor. Was it any sort of personal you know, health experience or interest or some moment that led you down that path? It was definitely a moment. Um, I have known forever since I was a little girl that I wanted to be a women's health doctor. And I was on that track. I went to college. I was pre-medicine and I worked in two different hospitals. Um, in one hospital, I worked in the pediatric wing, which was very sterile. It was very, um, just very not humanistic. And the other hospital that I worked in in town, I worked in their outreach program where we did a lot of diabetes education, weight education, blood pressure checks, blood pressure education. It's very education-based, and I loved it. The pediatric wing, um, I thought, if this is medicine, if this is what I'm going to do, I'm just going to prescribe, and it's going to be very scrubbed down. It's going to be very impersonal. It's going to be very fast. Um, that's not the kind of medicine that I wanted to practice. I went to college undergrad in Ohio, so we didn't 
have <laughs> naturopathic medicine. We didn't have functional medicine even, you know, then. Um, even massage was kind of considered, you know, not weird, just not, it just wasn't common. Acupuncture wasn't common. And so I moved out to the state of Oregon, and that's where I found naturopathic medicine. And I realized this is the kind of medicine I want to be in. This is the medicine where I can spend time with my patients and I can really work with them on their lifestyle and dietary choices and learn about nutrients and minerals and herbs before I jump into prescribing medications. Now, thankfully in the state of Oregon and in other states as well, I can prescribe. So if I have somebody who needs a medication or if they need, you know, thyroid medication or if they need, you know, something I can, an antibiotic, I can prescribe it. Um, but we, I try to work through that therapeutic order first to figure out, you know, what's going on and, and what can we do for this. Um, but yeah, I just got really disillusioned and I'm really happy that I found naturopathic medicine. <laughs> it's the medicine yeah. for me. <laughs> I mean, obviously I'm a bit biased, but when you're describing the naturopathic order or the therapeutic order, I'm sort of like, wouldn't you think this is just medicines order like for everybody it's just blows my mind there are so many things that we could talk about today and i want to talk about all of them knowing a bit about your specialties in mm -hmm. hormones and thyroid i actually have a thyroid issue at the moment that i take nature thyroid for mm -hmm. and adrenals and i want to ask you about all of it <laughs> but i also know that you have expertise in testing mm -hmm. and all things testing and so I wanted to focus on that specifically today because a lot of functional medicine doctors and practitioners right now, I think, claim to have cutting edge testing and biomarker this and you know, biohack that and that you know, they sort of allude to the fact that conventional medical doctors really aren't offering or have any of this kind of testing. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be covered under this real shroud of mystery as to how all this you know, amazing testing is being done and things are being found. And so people ask me all the time, like, you know, I feel like I have to see a functional doctor, but I can't afford it. Like, can you tell me what tests I, I really need? Maybe I can just ask my conventional doctor for them or, you know, what testing is being done when they just run routine blood work or whatever, you know, or they, they said my numbers were fine, but you know, you and I know, Carrie, that ranges really matter and that different labs have different ranges and that people need more information than just like your numbers look fine, um, right. especially if they're trying to sort out a chronic health issue and haven't been able to get to the bottom of it. So basically my question for you is, what is the difference between routine blood work that an average conventional doctor would order in an annual physical and what a functional medicine doctor or naturopath um, are currently ordering now? Yeah, that's actually a really good question because um, I think when I talk about this with patients, what I let them know is um, when you hear, I'll, I'll, run, I'll run a full panel on you, right? You go into your doctor, whatever, I'm tired or I'm having hair loss or you just go in and ask, can I have a full panel? Yes, yeah, sure. So what they tend to run is something called the CBC, which is a complete blood count. Um, it looks at your red and white blood cells, and that's great, but for the average person, um, it doesn't give us a lot of information unless maybe you're outright anemic or maybe you have an outright infection. Um, and then they run something called the CMP, uh, com uh, Comprehensive Metabolic Panel. So that's your kidney markers, some of your liver markers, um, usually there's a glucose in there, um, and if, you know, some of your potassium, calcium, those kind of things. Again, it's like a quick screen, um, it may not give you a whole lot of information. And sometimes they stop there. They're like, yeah, everything's fine. But they neglect to look at some of the other important markers like thyroid, like you were saying, you're, you know, handling a thyroid issue right now. So sometimes they'll run the one screening thyroid marker called the TSH or a uh, thyroid stimulating hormone. And then, it, and then my, my second sort of irritation besides routine blood work, which doesn't cover very much, um, is our ranges, just like you said. So you may get a TSH and the range is up to four and sometimes five, but functionally we might want it down around two or 2.5. But if you're at 4.9 and five is the cutoff, you may get told you're fine and you're not fine. You're like, you're like almost there. You're like almost in the abnormal. Why wait to get to the abnormal? It's the same for other iron markers. Uh, a lot of functional practitioners will run 
like let's say a, a ferritin, which is a marker for, for iron storage, but it's also an inflammation marker. And the range is ginormous. It's like 10 to 200. But if you're at 11, you're in range. And if you're at 199, you're in range. And you're like, oh, you're fine. You're in range. Like, no, it's a, it's a 190 point spread. Like, let's, we, we can optimize this to optimize you. And why wait? Why wait until you fall off a cliff to do something about it? And so sometimes just these general markers that are covered by insurance run at a normal lab, like the hospital or Quest or LabCorp, um, they're, you, your, your general doctor can do them. They're just going to read them a whole lot differently. They're going to look to the literal range as opposed to maybe optimizing it for you and what you're looking for. A follow-up question to that more specifically, what are you know the most important tests that every person and then separately every woman, because I think there are different tests relating to female hormones that are important to test for, um, should people be having done you know every year or if, it, if it's a different frequency, whatever that is? Well, honestly, the number one test that I think people sort of forget about is are the um, like your lipid markers, your cholesterol markers, but more so than just looking to see what your total cholesterol is. There's there are more advanced testing that even uh, common labs and hospitals run now that where they look at what's called particle size um, and for some inflammatory markers. Cardiovascular disease for men and women it's the number one killer. You know, we think. We might think something like it's cancer, it's breast cancer, it's prostate cancer. Um, it's not. It's actually cardiovascular disease. And just looking at your total cholesterol is, is not as helpful as you think. We want to actually see what's made up of that cholesterol, how big they are, how small they are, how inflammatory it is, um, how sticky your blood is. Some of these other extra cardiovascular things that you can test every year and then you can track because it's the number one killer. So you may be fine in your 30s, getting iffy in your 40s, and by the time you maybe get into your 50s and 60s, you know, like you could have seen the pattern through the years and been like, oh, I need to do something about this. Same goes for diabetes. You know, so much of um, the world, unfortunately, are obese and overweight, which brings an increased risk for diabetes and pre-diabetes. So I'm a big stickler with my patients, especially as weight loss is a number one complaint of a lot of my patients. Um, that I'm looking at their glucose fasting. I'm looking at their insulin fasting. Um, I'm looking at something called a hemoglobin A1C fasting. Again, I'm trying to get an idea of how much risk you're at and then track the pattern through the years. If I see their insulin starting to get up you know, in numbers and their glucose starting to get up in numbers, then I can swoop in and, and intervene. And a lot of times the early intervention are easy. You know, it's, it's dietary changes. It's, it's lifestyle changes. It's getting better sleep. Believe it or not, it has a huge impact on blood sugar. Reducing stress has a huge impact on blood sugar. Um, but if you catch it too late, if all of a sudden you go in and you're diabetic, um, you went from zero to 10, you know, like you fell off the cliff already. And so those are some really big sort of areas that I feel are really important for people to get tested. On top of that though, I'm a big stickler for vitamin D. Um, I find that vitamin D insufficiency is really big and the range is kind of um, wide. And so I know a lot of conventional doctors just follow the range, you know, as long as you're in range, you should be, you're okay. But if you're down at the low end of the range, you might be an increased risk for maybe cancer or autoimmune or mood issues or bone issues. And so we have to be careful of that lower vitamin D level. Thyroid. I'm a big fan of testing thyroid because so much gets in the way of our thyroid and more so than just looking at TSH. TSH is that marker between the brain and the thyroid, but it doesn't give us the actual hormone that's out in our system floating around, your, your T4 and your T3. And then nowadays, autoimmune is so prevalent. Um, there are two forms of autoimmune with thyroid. One is called Hashimoto's, which I would imagine a lot of people have heard of or very familiar with. Um, and then the other one is called Graves' disease, and we're seeing the rise in both. Um, it's, it's just it's just incredible. And if we can catch it and intervene early in somebody, then um, th then that's so much better than like ten years from now, where you feel terrible and you've been falling apart for ten years, and nobody, everyone looks at you just your red and white blood cells and calls you good. You're like, oh, you're fine. I'm like, I don't care about my red and white blood cells. I want to know what my thyroid is. <laughs> And so some of these tests, it's taking 
maybe the basics of what your doctor might order and just expanding it. So ordering, being more comprehensive, being more well-rounded and then tracking it through the years. And I think people forget that, you know, health, health is their responsibility. So I'm always telling people, you know, keep your lab results. You know, if you're organized, create an Excel spreadsheet, you know, write it down, keep it in a file folder. So you can actually go back and see, oh my gosh, my blood sugar has gone from 85 and now it's 90 and you know, five years from now I'm at 101. Like, oh, we like, that's really bad. That's pre-diabetic. Um, we, we need to, I used to be 85. We need to do something versus just becoming diabetic one day and you're completely blindsided and scared. But if you track and pay attention and do it regularly, then it's so much easier. Yeah. Um, I have a mild Hashimoto's, um, <laughs> mild because it's so confusing to me as it you know, goes back and forth from hypothyroidism to Hashimoto's. Like I have the last blood test was like 35, you know, the number of antibodies was just mm. 35. And I know people that have them in the hundreds and thousands. Mm -hmm. So there's some debate, I think, amongst different kinds of practitioners, if that's like through and through Hashimoto's. But anyway, I'm charting a course as to get, <laughs> get reverse it. But on that topic of thyroid and you know, other hormonal imbalances and adrenal issues. Are there additional tests that you think are important? You know, you mentioned the full thyroid panel, but things that can, you know, because you specialize in hormones, are there different kinds of tests for understanding hormonal imbalance that a conventional doctor wouldn't do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of conventional doctors will maybe run an estro estrogen, which is the main one is called estradiol or E2. Um, and maybe they'll run a progesterone. But the thing about hormone testing um, is that a woman needs to be aware of her cycle because your hormones go up and down, sort of like a, you know, in symphony throughout your cycle. And you need to know what day you're testing so that we can apply the ranges accordingly. So when I'm looking at estrogen and progesterone, I'm looking about five to seven days after she ovulates. And a woman who has a 28 day cycle, it's generally like day 19, 20 or 21. Because what will happen is women will say, I got my progesterone run. Um, it's near zero. My doctor's freaking out. What do I do? And I'll say, well, when in your cycle did you have it run? And she's like, I don't know. I had it run on Monday at noon when I had my appointment. Like, nope, that's not helpful because progesterone's supposed to be really low in the first half of your cycle. And then it gets really high in the second half of your cycle. So timing counts for the cycling woman. For the menopausal woman, it doesn't matter because she's not cycling. So she can test whenever but the other thing that I like to check um, when it gets into that functional kind of um, personal biohacker type testing is I then like to look at pathways. I like to look at, we call them metabolites. So you make an estrogen as a woman, where does it go? So I want to know, are, am I or you effectively detoxing it out of your body? Do you go through what's called phase one detox okay? Do you go through phase two detox? Do you go through phase three detox? Because if you don't, that's when you get those increased estrogen symptoms, PMS, weight gain, maybe um, endometriosis is worse, fibroids, heavy periods, mood swings, maybe increased cancer risk like breast cancer and endometrial cancer. So I not only want to know your estrogen, I want to know where it goes. Same for things, women, like your testosterone. We forget that testosterone and the other, another big hormone, uh, DHEA, super important for us women for sex drive, for lean muscle mass, for energy, for bone health. And not only do I want to know if we make it, because like we want all those things, but I want to know where it goes because one of the pathway increases our like acne or cystic acne, especially on our jawline. Um, it increases the hair growth in places that we really don't want as women. It increases our male, like our um, uh, hair loss, but in the male pattern baldness. So she'll lose it sort of at the, at the temples or receding type hairline, you'll see women will get. And so she may say, I think I need testosterone, but if, if I do it, it makes me angry. It makes, gives me acne. It makes me have hair growth. And by knowing these pathways, I can help intervene and we can do something about it, either from diet and lifestyle or even with supplements to help shift it. So I like this extra testing when it comes for women. I want to be really pretty comprehensive because if you're a woman going to the doctor complaining of hormonal stuff, 
like you don't just need the basics. Like you, you usually have got some serious stuff going on enough so that you're at the doctor. And I want to find out, I want to be very personalized. Like here, here's where things are going wrong right here. Let's address it. Right. No, I love that. Um, so two things I hear constantly from people asking for more information from me about is testing for inflammation yeah. um, and testing for gut health. Like how basically, how can they tell if they have not really many symptoms, but might have some little gut thing going on and, or, you know, live a pretty standard American life and then think they probably do have inflammation, but don't really know how to figure that out. Are there any good tests for that that you do regularly? There are two sort of main inflammatory markers we talk about a lot. One is called ESR, um, and the other is called a CRP. Uh, typically, we do a CRPHS for how uh, sensitive and specific it is. They're non-specific in that if they're positive, it doesn't mean you have inflammation in your brain or your intestines or your joints. So whereas one person may be very inflamed in the brain, where they're having lots of brain fog, lots of brain fatigue, um, maybe even headaches, another person may be very inflamed in their intestines. So they're bloated, maybe they have constipation or diarrhea, maybe they get heartburn, but you may not see those markers increase because one, they're not, they're not super specific, um, and they may not completely relate to inflammation in those areas. So inflammation unfortunately, is really hard to test for broadly. We tend to have to like focus in on where the problem is. So if somebody says, um, I get joint pain, my joints get red and swollen, um, you know, they, they, hurt, they obviously hurt to move. And then if I'm thinking more autoimmune, I might test them for rheumatoid arthritis. If somebody says, I'm having some intestinal things, I'm getting bloating, I get... Um, you know, gas, um, maybe their gas smells. And so now I'm thinking bacteria, maybe candida. And so I'm doing stool testing. So when I'm looking for inflammation, um, I, I actually have to look more pinpoint to the area. There's not one broad, wonderful marker I can run that says, yep, you are inflamed and here's where it is. That would be great. If that existed, <laughs> make my make everybody's life so much easier. Yeah, uh, I, there was yeah. one I was thinking of. I think it was you may have already referred to it, but the like CRP or yeah, um, CRP is a big one. And, and if it's positive, like you definitely have inflammation for sure. But I have patients who have inflammation, whether it's their skin, their gut, their joints, wherever, and um, their CRP is not elevated. Other markers are elevated that tells me there's inflammation but sort of that broad general marker is not, which also goes back to our sort of conventional MD thought process. If you go to your doctor and say, I just feel inflamed and they run a CRP and it's normal, I don't want people to get blown off. I don't want them to feel like it's all in their head or, well, my inflammatory marker is negative. It must be wrong because it's, it's, when it's positive, it's positive and it absolutely means something, but when it's negative, I'm still searching because um, I know that I have to go sort of system by system to figure it out. Yeah. And there are other markers that will be thrown off by inflammation, like cortisol. Cortisol tends to go up with inflammation. Um, there's a, another adrenal hormone, DHEAS, will go down with inflammation. Um, estrogen will tend to go up with inflammation. So I will see patterns in people where I can say, you know what, inflammation is causing these other things to change. Let's figure out where the inflammation is. Mm -hmm. I didn't know enough about it. And so when I heard about CRP, I just sort of figured if you did have any kind of inflammation in your body, that would be positive. But it's fascinating to hear that people very clearly have other things going on as you know, represented by their symptoms and that they can have a CRP that comes back not elevated. That seems, that's wild to me. And you're totally right in that a lot of the patient stories of health recovery that we've told at Wellbe had multiple situations of going to conventional doctors and saying, like, something is wrong with me, like my skin, my gut, my mental health, things are happening. And the doctor's taking certain tests, maybe it was CRP or not, I'm not sure, and saying, nope, like, we don't see anything, you're okay, go home. And they're like, are you not listening to what I'm saying? Like, are you not looking at me? You know, that sort of thing. So it's nice to hear you say that. Okay, so I know that there, from my own functional medicine doctor, that there are major differences between labs. Mm -hmm. So, but most patients, 
they have no say in which lab actually takes their blood, right? They just go to the doctor, the doctor either refers them to a lab and that's that, or just takes it in the office and sends it out to a lab and they have no idea or say about all of that going on. Um, can you talk about the difference in lab qualities? And you already mentioned the difference in ranges, but as far as I understand, a lot of the labs set their ranges. So, you know, depending on where you're sending it, it can, you know, show up that you actually are quite vitamin D deficient, for example, and in other labs, they're saying you're in range and everything's fine. Um, and are there any kind of national labs that you think are better than others that you like to, you know, send out to? I know some of the big ones are like Quest or Bioreference or LabCorp. Well, so that's actually a really good question. When we, when we test things, you, there are different machines you can test them on. So um, the cheaper way is by on something called an immunoassay. And a lot of, it's not as sensitive and it's not as specific, but it's definitely a lot cheaper. So I will absolutely have patients who will, for example, they'll order their own lab work. You know, they'll get on a website where you can order your own and they'll just, you know, they'll see estrogen, some estrogen options or there's testosterone options and they'll choose the cheap option. Cause of course, no, I, I don't blame them. They don't want to spend, why would you spend a hundred when you can spend 25 and it looks like it's the same hormone. But an immunoassay is not as sensitive and specific, whereas something else on different machine is called a mass spec. There's different forms. So there's what's called a, a liquid chromatography or gas chromatography. So you'll see it listed as LCMS, so liquid chromatography mass spec, or GCMS, gas chromatography mass spec. Anything mass spec is much more sensitive, much more specific. And I definitely had um, other practitioners who've sent me lab work where it just looked crazy. I had a, a recently a, a colleague of mine say, this guy's estrogen is through the roof. They can't figure it out. And it turned out they had run his estrogen marker on an immunoassay. And when they reran it on a mass spec, it was actually in range, but the immunoassay, a lot can interfere. And it was a false positive. It was a false freak out, really. And so I know it's more expensive, but I tell people like, if you can afford it, if, if you can pay the money, when you're choosing these options, try to choose the mass spec option because you want that sensitivity and specificity. And then you can compare apples to apples every time. Because if sometimes you're getting immunoassay and sometimes you're getting mass spec, it's not apples to apples. So you can't really compare. And if one time it's high and the next time it's low, it's like, well, but it's a sensitivity and specificity difference. And so we don't actually know if the first time was high and the next time was low, depending on which route that you chose. Um, so that, and I know that can be really hard because working in a lab, I didn't know this before I worked in a lab. And now that I worked in a lab, I'm like, oh, <laughs> this makes a huge freaking difference. <laughs> My goodness. And so no matter what you pick, Quest or LabCorp, both are quite good for sure. If you get an option, try, try to pick that try to pick the mass spec option, try to pick the option that will give you, especially for hormones, will give you that, that um, sensitivity that you, that you want, that you can actually you know, use the data and, and compare it to. But when it goes to ranges, um, yes, labs set their own ranges. Um, a really classic example are, is the testosterone range for men. If you look back in research, they have been dropping men's testosterone ranges through the years because men's testosterone is naturally dropping, not naturally, unnaturally dropping, it has been dropping. Um, and instead of keeping the original ranges that these were men 20 years ago, um, they're meeting, they're lowering with the times. And so now men who have low testosterone are actually really low as in, like, compared to 20 years ago. And men who are in range may be low compared to 20 years ago, but labs will adjust to the clientele that they have coming through, um, which same for diabetes, you know, they've, they've, they've shifted what's considered diagnosis of diabetes because unfortunately our, you know, our blood sugars are rising. And so they're to accommodate, they're kind of raising like, Oh, you're not diabetes until here now. Like, no, <laughs> right. It used to be in the, you know, in the, in the, or in the, um, low hundreds. Now it's 126. Like, come, let's tighten this up. Why are we allowing pre-diabetes to be a thing? Like, let's, let's tighten this up and really help America be aware and get healthy. Don't, don't keep giving, you know, excuses and, you know, making it easier for people to be unhealthy. 
let's be real. So that's, so that's the other hard part with labs is um, the ranges are shifting because we as humans are unfortunately getting more unhealthy. I'm so glad you brought up that example because I had that experience with my functional medicine doctor and um, my whole family sees her and um, my husband started seeing her and, and he, you know, had some blood work done and came to me and said, you know, did you know what, what's happened to the mercury range? Um, he, you know, he had had a little bit of elevated mercury and heard that, you know, because our seafood and our oceans have become so polluted and are increasingly so, especially with mercury poisoning or with mercury in the oceans and then people getting mercury poisoning, they keep upping the range of what's normal. What's and acceptable. So, yeah, like 20 years ago, same thing. The amount of mercury in people's blood would have been very alarming. And now so many hundreds of thousands, millions of people are walking around with mercury poisoning undiagnosed until, like you said before, they fall off a cliff with something. And the whole time it could have been avoided had there been an earlier intervention of just like, hey, cut it out with the fish for a while, like, or, you know, have some cilantro or whatever. You got to detox. Yeah. Men are a great example when I do the testosterone range, but I'll say just because you're in the range doesn't mean you're in the optimal range. You know, just because you're in your age range, just because you're in the range of a 50 year old man, it doesn't mean it's the right range for you. And look, let's look at your symptoms and everything else, because I know these ranges are not bogus, but kind of bogus, <laughs> you know, they're kind of made up. You know, I think about it sort of like being in school and like technically you can pass the class and not fail it with an A to a D, right? Right, right. But yeah. It's a D great example. Mm -hmm. is not optimal. Like you did not get much out of that class. Like there's an issue. You may want to retake it or figure out what's going on. Like yeah. if you're getting C's in all your classes, you're headed for um, likely an issue, you know, should you know, at somewhere down the road, unless you're of course like some amazing entrepreneur that gets all C's and then, you know, right. <laughs> and they can pull it together. <laughs> right. Somehow pulls it together, which I think is a great analogy for health as well, that you can have these, you know, suboptimal numbers that are technically in range and pull it together before it ever becomes a disease. Like you said, with just a few weeks of mm -hmm. diet change or different lifestyle practices or, um, certain supplements for nutritional deficiencies and all of that. So the body is so resilient if you get it in time, but reversing those diseases, as you know, once you have a diagnosis is much harder. Right. Yep. I agree. So I Next question for you, because I at first thought that Dutch test, when I looked it up, was a consumer facing, you know, like at home kit, mm -hmm. which it's not. Um, but because of that, I've started thinking about that and wanted to ask you a couple of questions about these direct-to-consumer, you know, at-home testing kits. So I'm sure you've heard of ones like Ubiome, which is currently yeah. sort yeah. of in some hot water. <laughs> yeah, but. And Biome and Everly Well, and then of course right. the DNA genetic testing kits like 23andMe, Color, and there's, you know, a few others. Right. Um, they sound so exciting. Like, Every time I hear about one or go on their website, right. I want to order all of them. I think it's like the coolest thing on earth. Right. Um, are they accurate, worth it? Um, are there any in particular that you do or don't recommend as being more, you know, valuable or worth the money or, e you know, an easier test to do with at-home testing and others that you say, like, that's really not something that you can do with a kit? Right. Well, so my only issue with at-home testing, I'm, I'm all about patients advocating for themselves. My, the part that I have a hard time with is now you have all this information as a patient, but you're not in medicine and you don't know how to read it. So you're just on Dr. Google trying to piece it together, or you're in chat boards trying to piece it together, or you're talking to your neighbor and trying to piece it together, and you may actually do more harm than good. And so that's my only concern with them. Um, otherwise, actually, a lot of them, like, um, and I think you said, like, the tests like Everly Well offers, a lot of the Everly Well are actual everyday standard functional tests just run funneled through one easy to order site, which makes it really convenient versus having to try to go to multiple sites and see what you can do. You just go to Everly Well and, and, and get everything there that you need. Um, and the same goes for some of those other, like, the stool testing. They can give you a lot of great information. Um, I don't 
I don't work for, um, you know, like Viome, but they're in a little trouble. So um, maybe or, not or I think it's Ubiome. Oh, Ubiome, not Viome. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. Viome. Ubiome. It is Ubiome. Um, yeah. They're in a little bit of trouble. Um, but no, I think a, some, a lot of these tests that are, that are to consumer, they actually, a lot of them have a to physician as well on the back end. They're just making it available to people who want it on the front end for the consumer. Um, but again, the hard part that I just find is that now I get all these questions from people who say, all right, I have my results. I have my 23 in me. What do I do? Like I have all this data. What do I do? Like, I know now you have to find a naturopathic or a functional practitioner who understands it. So yay for you. I'm glad you ordered it and took initiative, but, um, now you still need help reading it. Um, right. that's the hard, that's the only hard part. Well, but that's exciting to me to hear that the kits that you, you know, you mentioned specifically a stool kit, like a Viome or some of the ones that are on Everly Well are effective though. You know, maybe yes. the aftermath yes. is a little yes. bit precarious, yes. but I wasn't sure if like you hear about, you know, amazing like stool tests and fecal transplants that like infectious disease doctors do or this like, right, right. like MTHFR gene testing that certain functional doctors do. And so yeah. I wasn't sure like, did right. they have totally different tests mm -hmm. from something like Everly Well, or is it just that Everly Well is, you know, making it available to patients, which is great. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. But MTHFR is a really good example because um, MTHFR is a SNP and a lot of people sort of get hung up on it and they think they have the, you know, I have the MTHFR disease. I'm going to get cancer and, oh, I've been diagnosed with MTHFR. I'm like, well, first of all, it's not a diagnosis. And second of all, it's one little SNP. Now it does a lot. It's very important, but it's one little SNP in a sea of SNPs that make a lot of enzymes that do a lot of things. And it's like, um, like the wheels in a clock, you know, it's like the cogs in a clock. Like everything has to move to move each other. MTHFR is just not the only thing. So when I have people that say to me, you know, I have, I ha I ha I've been diagnosed with MTHFR. I'm like, well, that's one of many. <laughs> and right. it's important, but don't just go after that one. It, it definitely is much bigger than just looking at that one SNP that makes one enzyme, you know, so you gotta be careful. Totally. And uh, my, I just had that experience with my stepmother went to a functional medicine doctor and said, oh, I have the MTHFR gene. And sorry for anybody listening who doesn't know what that is. MTHFR is a gene that has a lot to do with your folate um, and the way that you um, uh, process folate. So when you eat folate or folic acid, uh, like from food and greens and stuff, it all gets funneled in. And then MTHFR is a big one to help you you can make have folate, which is the active form. Folic acid is actually not the active form. In fact, folic acid will um, bind to receptors and make them inactive. So you have to be really careful. But folate is super, super, super important for so many things, so many um, detoxification pathways, so many, like even estrogen, how we clear out our estrogen. Folate is, is a part um, of that pathway. It's important for, the, I mean, the list is long, but we also know that MTHFR or folate has a lot to do with like our mood, right? And there's a lot of um, depression, anxiety, fatigue, uh, things that go with it. But because it's been so sensationalized that I find a lot of people hang their hat on this one SNP, genetic SNP, it's a big picture. You have to look at the big picture because right. if you have MTHFR, you have to look at them. There's other ones like there's one called COMT and, uh, you know, CBS and BHMT and MAT and like, right. So there's all of these MTR. And so just because you have MTHFR, maybe it's functioning just fine. That's the other thing. If you get your genetics and you find out that it's, um, broken, you have a mutation, it doesn't mean that it's actually a problem. So the gene just tells you what you've got but we have to look at the other end too. Do you actually have a problem with folate? Do you actually have a problem with um, detoxification? Do you actually have a problem with estrogen? And if you don't, then you don't have to do anything about it. It's like your body has managed to figure it out, find workarounds, balance. Just because we're talking about testing, what sort of test would help people to see those things? Like whether it's working or not, you know, whether they're able to, you know, move estrogen through and things like that. Right. So I'll actually, so I'll give you a good example because, um, well, selfishly, I work for them. So a lot of people will run another SNP called COMT. 
And COMT helps you detoxify your estrogen. It also helps you detoxify your uh, dopamine and your norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is your adrenaline, essentially. So some people will be like, oh my gosh, I have the mutation for COMT. I have a problem with estrogen detox. But then I run the Dutch test on them and I see that they don't. They don't. Their estrogen is detoxifying just fine as far as we can tell. They don't have to do anything about it. The gene is not as maybe broken or mutated as you thought, or the body has found different workarounds. And then in that case, don't do anything. Don't spend the money on extra supplements that you read about in a chat room. Like you don't need to. It's, everything is fine. Right. But the reverse can happen. The reverse is I can see people who have definitely really unhealthy estrogen detox pathways. And then I'll say, yes, not only do you have your genetics, you know your COMT is broken, mutated, but it's also showing up in your estrogen as well. We have to do something about it. Right. And when you say showing up in your estrogen, it's the estrogen levels you're looking at. To see. It's actually, yeah. So estrogen levels, but really it's a, the pathway when estrogen goes from phase one uh, detoxification into phase two, which is where estrogen gets neutralized, um, which is a good thing. We want that. Um, COMT is a big, 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 big player for that. And so if I'm not seeing her or his estrogen get neutralized in that phase two, then I strongly suspect that COMT, that SNP, which is an enzyme really, um, is, the, is the big issue. And so I'm looking actually at some of those downstream functional patterns that I was saying that you won't catch in blood work, but you will catch in more specialized testing. Got it. It's so fascinating. So on the topic of um, tests that people can ask for from conventional doctors that you know aren't going to go this deep, um, or are not going to be able to put the pieces together, it sounds like you know under the hood of what the original number in the test is. Um, what do you recommend for people that just you know can't really afford anything other than a standard you know annual? appointment from a conventional doctor that's completely covered by insurance and or doesn't believe that they can right. um, or won't but you know and and just kind of wants to take back a bit of control about what's being tested and and trying to get more involved but doesn't obviously understand the lingo or know what to ask for or what to make sure they had you know what do you recommend for people like that just because your doctor that you're currently seeing, your primary care doesn't believe in it, doesn't mean other MDs don't believe in it, right? Other nurse practitioners, other physician's assistants, and they still may also take insurance. So there are a high number of functional type or functional leaning or integrative practitioners who take insurance. And so maybe if you're not thrilled with the person you're seeing, they're not helping you as much, they don't believe in it, they don't sort of take that root cause approach Go through your insurance panel. Go, you know, start doing, you have to do some research. Start asking some friends, look some, do some research online. The great thing with, you know, social, med or social media is that so many of these practitioners are on, their clinics are on Facebook and their clinics are on Instagram and you can hashtag search or you can local area search and see, is there a naturopathic doctor in my area who takes insurance, which is entirely possible in a lot of states. Um, is there a functional practitioner, an MD, a DO, a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant who believes in functional medicine and is under my insurance? And so that's an actually really, really good start because you don't have to stick with the doctor you have for this kind of stuff. Like if you love your doctor for when you get a cold, when you need a pap smear, when you're ready for your mammogram, um, you know, when you, when you just, just, it's just the family doctor great, keep them. But if you want somebody who does functional, they're out there. You just have to do a bit of searching and then just see if they take your insurance because I'm finding that a, a lot of them do. Now, a lot of them don't. A lot of them moved into the sort of a cash pay uh, based model. Um, but there are still some out there and you may find somebody that will work for you, which is really great. The other thing I do suggest is to get yourself educated. So I know like Dr. Google and, um, uh, you know, some of the chat boards are, are not, are not the greatest, but you know, like, look, look at the WellBe site, you know, like look at some of these really great um, sort of educational sites that are trying to help explain what estrogen is, hormones are, thyroid balance, start following some of these practitioners on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, who are giving away 
so much free information. Get their books. If, if thyroid is your problem, there are some great authors out there who've written about thyroid. Um, Dr. Datis Karazian, um, Isabella Wentz, Dr. Alan Christensen. They've got great, excellent, you know, spend the 10 bucks on Amazon, get their book and, and get educated. PCOS, they've got some great authors out there on PCOS. They're all over social media. They're giving away free information, not medical advice, but at least helping you connect the dots to your symptoms and maybe some of the lab work that um, you've had drawn. So take advantage of it and, and, and study up, you know, be careful of the chat rooms, be careful of the, the, those kind of things, but like really follow some of these experts who are posting every day and doing Facebook lives where they walk through this sort of stuff and case examples and their favorite supplements and why and utilize it, take it to your advantage. Um, if, if money, even if money's not an issue, like take it to your advantage, you know, right. Why, why spend however much it could be thousands of dollars when there's so much free information. And I am yeah. such a believer in what you said. And that's sort of why I started Wellbe is that be, I yep. stand, you know, the eye roll that a lot of conventional doctors give you about, Oh, did you read that on Google or whatever? Google can be a really good source. I mean, definitely I've had patients who printed off research studies for me. You know, they're like, I Googled this thing. I found this research paper. I'm not entirely sure what it means. Can we talk about it? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Or I Googled and I found this site and this is what they're explaining. They're a doctor too. Are they, you know, what do you think? I'm like, let's talk about it for sure. Right. Yes, I find that I have such great resources. If you just know how to tell sites that are really interested in evidence-based, you know, information on alternative, integrative, functional, holistic, whatever people want to call it, medicine versus just sort of conspiracy-minded sites that will talk about some of this medicine stuff and also talk about politics and like all of these things together. And it's kind of just like a we don't believe in the system and you know some of their claims and things that they think are wrong are valid or might be valid but when you're looping it all in together it's just kind of attracting people who have issues with like all systems and governments and all all of it instead of just being able to really focus on like just the medicine and just looking at um the latest in right. research yeah. on thyroid health or adrenal fatigue or whatever it might be and not being fear-based, right? Some of these sites are very fear-based and then they scare you into thinking. It's like, no, the site should be more educational. So you as the consumer can make an educated decision. It's your decision, no matter what. Right. You know, it's your, your body. Your so. body. And, and even mm -hmm. if the information is fear-inducing in the sense that, you know, some statistics around, like you were talking about testosterone going down in men and mm -hmm. how much mercury is in our oceans and, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these issues with um, gly glycophate in, in food mm. that they're seeing or whatever, it's not just fear for the sake of fear. It's presenting factual reports and studies that have come out and you know might end up inciting a little bit of fear, but it's good healthy fear in the sense that you can make changes and take more action. Right. Um, right. Because glyphosate different. is bad and you know mercury is bad. <laughs> right. Exactly. You're bad. I wonder, you know, when I'm putting certain research things out. I, I do this thing called the Wellbe Wrap Up, um, which is this uh, monthly, now it's bi-monthly actually, kind of overview of like the top 10 or top five things, re research and studies, news pieces related to health and wellness. And I feel are really important for the Wellbe audience to know that they may have missed because I read so much research and they, mm -hmm. you know, only maybe hear the stuff that makes it to CBS or NBC mm -hmm. News yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, The Guardian or whatever they're reading. And sometimes I'm like, oh my God, all this stuff is just so depressing and terrifying. Do I even put it out there? And then I'm like, well, I got to put some of it out there because like people should know if things are kind of going the wrong direction with our food supply or our, you know, types of medicine or our, you know, chemicals in our water or whatever, like, you know, they, they are voters at the end of the day too. So they yep. should be able to kind of think about this stuff. Um, but I do want to ask you, like two more questions about testing before we wrap up today, because I know you have a lot to do and I appreciate your time. Um, so I know that you work for Dutch test and it's a hormone test. So can you just talk a little bit about what a hormone test is and maybe why Dutch test is 
you know, better than the other ones that are on the market? And, um, you know, what is on the market if people are interested in getting hormone tests? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in the naturopathic field since 1999. So a really long time. And about a year ago, my mom, who was a huge supporter of me said to me, um, you know what, honey, I'm not even really sure what a hormone is, but you talk about it all the time. And I listen to everything <laughs> you say, but I'm still not really sure. And I was like, I have failed. My mom doesn't know what a hormone is. So just for people who maybe get confused. So a hormone is, is basically a chemical messenger. And we our hormone system, the fancy term is our endocrine system is what we call it. So it's, it's our thyroid, it's our adrenals, it's our, it's our ovaries for boys, it's our testicles and so forth. And they put out the hormones like estrogen or progesterone or testosterone or thyroid um, that, that binds to receptors and does the things. So it's based, they're basically chemical messengers. Now, when we women primarily talk about hormones, like I'm, I feel my hormones are off or I feel hormonal today, we are generally talking about estrogen and progesterone for the most part, um, and to a lesser degree, things like testosterone, DHEA, cortisol, thyroid. Even though they're very, very important, I just mean for reference when women say, I'm hormonal today, she usually means estrogen and progesterone. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to testing those things, um, I, work for, I work for the Dutch test. And so Dutch is an acronym. It stands for Dried Urine Test for comprehensive hormones. And so we look at um, almost everything but thyroid. We don't look at thyroid, but we do look at all the estrogens. You have three of them. We look at progesterone, we look at testosterone, we look at um, cortisol, we look at DHEA, melatonin, um, you know, because we wanna understand sleep and stress. And then we do some other really cool markers as well. And it's a urine test, meaning you urinate on these little pieces of filter paper, kind of like a pregnancy test, and you do it four times in the day, sometimes five. Um, you let them dry and then mail them back to the lab. So it's a very easy to collect test. There's no blood draw. Um, there's no saliva if you don't want to. We do have a specialized sort of advanced test that does have a combination saliva and urine. Um, but it's a cotton swab. You don't actually have to spit in a tube um, if some, for people listening who've ever done a saliva test. And we also give you what are those, those pathways that I mentioned earlier. We look at estrogen detoxification. We look at testosterone pathways if you have acne and hair loss. We look at more than just cortisol. We look at cortisol uh, production, which is called metabolized cortisol. And we look at cortisone, which is inactive. So a lot of people think they're really tired because they don't make cortisol. And really, they just deactivate it all to cortisone. You don't test, you don't know. And the treatment is different. The low cortisol and too much cortisone, different treatments. And so it's, it's important to know, to know both. So that's what the Dutch test is. But there are other um, kind of specialty uh, tests on the market that are a little bit similar. So there's what's called a 24-hour urine. Um, it's where you collect literally all of your urine in a bucket, for, well, in an orange jug is what it is, for 24 hours. And so you get very similar markers. It's just um, a lot harder to collect. It's more of a pain. It's, it's more kind of, you know, it's a lot of collection to collect your urine for 24 hours. And because it's in one jug, you also don't get your cortisol pattern in the day. Whereas in the Dutch test, we tell you what's your cortisol in the morning, what is it mid-morning, mid in the afternoon, and before bed. Um, and then another test that I get asked a lot about is saliva testing. So saliva testing is where you spit in a tube four, sometimes five times in a day, and you get your basic hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. You do get your cortisol pattern, which again is very nice. Am I high in the morning or low in the morning? Am I high at night or low at night? But unfortunately with saliva, you don't get any of those pathways. So you don't get the detox pathways. You don't get the testosterone pathway. You don't get melatonin. You sort of miss out on some things. But the collection's nice if you're afraid of um, blood draw. <laughs> Nobody likes a blood draw. So those are kind of your hormonal options out there. Um, and then a blood draw is your most basic. You just, you can get an estrogen and a progesterone and a testosterone, um, but you don't get your cortisol pattern. You don't get your pathways, your detoxification. You don't get any of that. So the Dutch is nice because it's easy to collect and you get a massive amount of information about you. That's amazing. So it's something that people can't just order themselves, right? On they can order themselves. They can oh. order themselves. Yes. We much highly prefer that somebody go through a practitioner again, because you'll get about six pages of data. And if you're new to hormones, um, 
you just feel like you're hormonal and you run the test, it can definitely be overwhelming. And we don't want people to be overwhelmed to the point where they do no action. We, we would really, ref, we'd prefer to refer them to somebody who can walk them through what it means and then give them a, you know, a plan of action so that they can feel better. Got it. That yes. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so speaking of being referred to doctors and practitioners, you have been doing this a long time and I'm sure know a lot of people um, in the field of both you know, naturopathic medicine and otherwise. And at Wellbe, a lot of people ask us for great, you know, recommendations of doctors and practitioners. So are there any that you've seen in your own life um, that you really recommend, you know, anywhere in the country, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that list would be so hugely long, but I will give people actually, this may be, I don't know, this may be easier, um, just a resource to, to research. So people can absolutely call, or email, or, um, chat with Dutch test. If you go to dutchtest.com, we can find you a practitioner in your area. We can also find you a practitioner who does online um, Skype or Zoom uh, phone call type visits. If you go to naturopathic.org, there's a find a, a physician link there. And if you go to ifm.org, that's the Institute for Functional Medicine. So ifm.org they also have a find a physician as well. And so I, that's three really great resources for people and they can find someone in their area, find someone who does, uh, or their country, find somebody who you know, does online um, instead of you know, if there's nobody in their area. And so definitely there's options out there. We, there are amazing, amazing functional and naturopathic practitioners out there. So go find one. <laughs> go, yeah, go look them up. No, that's, that's super helpful. I mean, Unfortunately, what I see is that a lot of people ask me for, like, has somebody seen this person and said that they helped them, yeah. which is, you know, at the end of the day, it's because humans are so um, hardwired for trust and connection, yeah. and they want to know that somebody that they trust, or maybe that they're, you know, two or three degrees away, trust this person and had a good experience. And so, you know, I find sometimes, I, I totally agree, a lot of the... Um, you know, resources that you've just mentioned, I've used myself, but mm -hmm. I also find that people are like, just tell me that, you know, it worked for you. And that's, yeah, I know, I know. Get on board, you know, instead of just like, oh, there's 12 options of naturopaths in my area, but like who, you know, right. people, right. Who I, you know, who's really the right one for me. So yeah, and I get that, I'll get that question a lot where people will give me a city, right? I'll get an email from somebody or, or on social media, I'll get a message and they'll say, you know, who do you, rec who do you recommend for, let's say, um, like mold? Who do you recommend for, you know, I, I suspect mold. I think I have mold. And so I'll recommend someone and they'll go, oh, oh no, but I don't live there. I live, you know, in, in, in this city in Minnesota. I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> right. I don't know functional practitioners in every single city uh, across the United States or even across the world. But um, I do try to help direct people, especially in the bigger cities. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit easier. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. I help to try to direct people in big cities, but I, you know, sometimes get random requests and I don't want to make, a, you know, like, oh, these, I found these four people, one of these will work because I don't know if they're, you know, really that right. good. So right. it's a challenge that I'm trying to figure out for, for my audience for sure. But um, yeah. so I just thought I'd ask you that. And then last but not least, um, the other thing that the Wellbe community is very interested in is also, you know, how all of these incredible experts who live and breathe this stuff. And as you said, you know, have been practicing since 1999, what do they do in their own lives to ensure, you know, prevention and reversal of any chronic health issues when they come up? So we say, um, I get well be by blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so if you don't mind saying that and letting us know what are your, you know, absolutely can't miss, you know, wellness routines that you do every day. I get well be the most by um, affecting my circadian rhythm. And what I mean by that is, as humans, we are very affected by light and dark. Uh, every cell in our body responds to the circadian rhythm. And we are massively screwing it up because we are on our phones, we're on our computers, we're on watching TV late at night, we're doing all this stimulatory stuff, and then we wake up tired. So what I get well be by, I'm off my phone at night or I wear my blue light blocking glasses. I do a lot of wind down stuff, right? Exactly. Um, I drink holy basil tea, which is called Tulsi, T-U-L-S-I. I drink Tulsi tea at night before bed. 
Um, I often, if I can, I'll do either take a bath or a shower. I have a sauna, so I'll do sauna um, and then and then shower before bed. And then what that does is it helps lower my cortisol, bring my melatonin up so I get good, solid, deep sleep. And in the morning, as soon as you wake up, I tell people, get light exposure. I can't stress this enough. And I don't mean light by your phone. I mean, open your drapes or open your blinds or get a full spectrum light box um, that you turn on next to your bed because that full spectrum light immediately goes into your eyes and it tells your brain, get up. This circadian rhythm is ready to go. It's called the cortisol awakening response. And so if you, and I have, I have people from all over the world that write me and say this, they're like, I now open my blinds in the morning before I play on my phone <laughs> or I get up and I take a five or 10 minute walk, or I go sit on my patio for five or 10 minutes and get the natural light in. And it's made a world of difference. So if you wind down at night, if you dark at night and light, as soon as you wake up in the morning, you will retrain your circadian rhythm. And it, 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 it's like life changing. It takes a couple of weeks but it works and it's cheap, free and easy. So that's how I get well be. <laughs> I love that. I haven't had that answer yet. And I no. couldn't agree more. I'm a really light sensitive sleeper. So, and we live in New York city. So I, you know, have my shades drawn and curtains drawn over them. So it's quite dark at night. But then the issue with that, of course, is when you wake up, it's still pretty dark, even if it's light out, it's been an issue for me. Cause I find if I fall into bad patterns, then I'm in bed with my phone and, you know, for too long. And then like, it's been kind of dark for a while and I kind of get up and get some light. But if I right away, you know, my husband drags me out of bed and we open the shades and I go out for a walk first thing, like that sets such a different feeling in my body for the rest of the day. Yep. Um, and similarly try very hard these days to have that last hour that I'm awake without any phone or TV with me. Um, obviously sometimes it doesn't work and I fall into bad patterns. Yep, but guilty. We're all, we all <laughs> human and luckily there's always another day to try it again. Um, so I love that, that that's something that you're super dedicated to because I can see from tons of research I've been reading how incredibly important it is and I am very dedicated now <laughs> to wearing my blue light blockers. <laughs> Yes. Well, Carrie, this has been so lovely. Thank you so much for your time and all of your expertise in the area of testing. And I could probably interview six more times on all the topics that I care about, like thyroid health and um, other, you know, hormonal issues. I have friends struggling with PCOS and, you know, there's a lot out there for free right now, as you say, and a lot of great books and experts, but it's still really hard to fix. So I think it's super important that there are doctors you know, really out there talking about these issues and that they are, you know, fixable. Um, yes. And it just takes a little bit of digging and you get that from testing. Um, mm -hmm. And also um, that you can, you know, use physicians who are really willing to do the work to roll up their sleeves, whether they're naturopaths or osteopaths or even open-minded MDs um, to help you get there. So your work is so inspiring. I know that people can find you on Instagram. It's Dr. Carrie at, Jones. At dr.carrie Jones. At dr.carriejones. Mm -hmm. And also on your website, which is? Um, I have two. So dutchtest.com. I do a lot there. And then at uh, uh, www.drcarriejones.com. Okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Oh, thank you so much.